Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to the Hindu News for Analysis for today. Before we go deeper into the Hindu newspaper articles and important announcement, this weekend that is Saturday live at 6 p.m. exclusively on the Baiju's Exam Prep app, we have an extremely important workshop for all of you. This workshop will cover all the important tricks and tips to keep in mind to excel in the UPSC Civil Service Examination of 2023. Don't forget to register for this workshop. The link to register is given in the description of the video, and this is going to be exclusively on the Baiju's Exam Prep app. So, if you have still not downloaded the app, do go ahead and download it right away. Let's begin with the first article now that is based on the theme of colonialism. The author here is saying that the government of India has been trying to get rid of colonial symbols for a long time now. However, one of the biggest symbols of colonialism in India is actually the use of English language that has been prevalent since our independence and it is just continuing. The author here says that if you look at how India has actually progressed as a nation after our independence, we still have a lot of symbols around us that can be connected to colonialism. Now, the governments across the world not just in india have been trying to get rid of these colonial symbols but it is not that easy the biggest example of colonial symbols as per the author is the use of english language in education for example we have been trying to get rid of english we have been trying to give a push to our local languages but that has not happened one of the reasons why it has not happened in india is unlike other nations india is a land of many many languages if there would have been a situation when india would have had one language or maybe two local languages and the third language would have been english in that case you could have gotten rid of english and you would have been able to go ahead with one single local language but the unique case of india is that our local languages also are so many and so diverse that there is no unity on which language to accept if not english and that is why english still remains a big big part of our education system it still remains a big big part of indian politics as well as you have seen every few months we have a debate on this the south indian states think that the center government irrespective of whichever party is in power is trying to impose the use of hindi on them and then they try to raise their voice against it The author here is saying that the middle class in India still looks at English as something aspirational, and they are not wrong in this. For a middle class or a lower middle class family, it is their dream to get their children educated in English medium education because they also know that their best chance of getting a good job is through the knowledge of English language, and that is why English has seen no sign of becoming unpopular in India. If anything more and more people are gravitating towards the English language in India even today. Whenever we talk about English, we actually go back to one single person that is Macaulay. As you know, Lord Macaulay was the one who introduced the education policy at the time of the British. The underlying theme of that policy mainly was to teach all the students in India in the English language so that they can actually have people in India who are ready to serve the British. the idea of lord macaulay was to europeanize the indian population so that they can actually work as a good workforce for the british people in india however apart from imposing english language as per the author macaulay did not have a lot of contribution in india's education policy of that time since our independence we have been trying to get rid of colonialism but this one symbol that is a symbol of language still is extremely extremely difficult to get rid of Now if you look at the history of Macaulay's minute that is the famous note of Macaulay on the Indian education system that has been discussed in India widely for almost 200 years now I'm sure all of you would have read this in modern history in 1830s when the british were thinking over what kind of education to impart to the indians there was a debate about what should be the language of that education well there were some people who wanted the language of the indian students to be the local languages others led by lord macaulay wanted the language to be english so that a good workforce can be developed in india so that the indians would never revolt against the british because their idea was to have such a population that actually is fond of english language and english way of living in 1835 british politician famous thomas macaulay presented his minute on indian education where he established a need to impart english education to the indian natives 
I'm sure you would have read, it was in the Indian Charter Act of 1813 that for the first time, a sum of 1 lakh rupees was set aside on educating the Indians and this debate started from then. How to utilize this 1 lakh rupee? And it was Macaulay whose word was taken as the final since he was a president of the General Committee on Public Instruction. Very famously, he had written that I believe that all the books that have been written in Sanskrit language collectively are less valuable than what may be found in the most paltry abridgment used at the preparatory schools in England. So he despised the Indian culture, the Indian local tradition so much that he said that all the knowledge available in Sanskrit altogether is not even equal to one single standard book in English. That is why Macaulay till date is seen as a villain in the context of the Indian education system. But still the irony is we are still following the similar kind of system that he had set up. He had also suggested the downward filtration policy, meaning that his idea was that the government should only educate few people at the top and then it will become their responsibility to pass on that education to the lower level called the downward filtration. Now, in the past few years, you might have seen the government time and time again mentioning the symbols of colonialism and mentioning that we are now trying to get rid of it as much as possible. You have seen recently how Kingsway has been renamed as the Kartavya Path. You also see how the government of India has been repeatedly saying that on the 75th year of India's independence, we have now entered Amrit Kal and we are now free from the shackles of colonialism. You might have also seen the Indian government changing the ensemble flag of the Indian Navy. All that is an indication that the government is trying to get rid of these symbols of colonialism. But as the author discussed, these are mere symbols. While the one thing that has remained an integral part of a life given by our colonial masters was the English language. The next article that we have here says that the persons with disabilities in India have been discriminated against in each and every sector, including the entertainment content sector. He says that the people who are blind, the people who can't hear, for them there is hardly any content out there. Even blind people want something to refresh in their day-to-day -day life. They also want to go out, maybe see a movie, maybe get some other kind of entertainment. But for them, there is absolutely no disabled-friendly content that is made across the country. He says that there are two very important tools that can be used to resolve this. One, there can be audio description of the movies as and when they are played and there can be subtitling so that people who can't hear can actually read the subtitles. However, both of these things are hardly used in the Indian entertainment sector. There is a law in India called the Rights of Persons with Disability Act of 2016 which says that the government should take measures to ensure that people with hearing impairment can have access to television programs with sign language interpretation or subtitles. But you also know in reality this is hardly the case. The law also says that the person with disability should have access to electronic media by providing audio description, sign language interpretation and closed captioning. Now, the harsh reality is that there are hardly any programs that you see on TV or on the OTD platform that have sign language along with them. There is hardly any content that is actually suitable for people who are blind or the people who can't hear properly. Even though the Information Broadcasting Ministry back in 2019 had asked the Central Board for Film Certification to actually ask the filmmakers to produce these kind of content, but that did not happen. There were a few movies, handful of them like Sanju, Andadhun, etc. that were made friendly for these disabled, but these are just very, very few examples in between. There are a lot of reasons why this has not happened. First, the film producers think that this is just not required. They think that the population of people who actually would consume this content is hardly any number and it would not be a financially viable decision. Secondly, many production houses might not even know how to do that. They might not even know which are the companies that can help them in doing this. Thirdly, the civil society groups that is, the NGOs, etc., should force the government and the Central Board for Film Certification to actually go ahead and implement these directives, which has not been the case. The INB ministry also has to take up the responsibility. Now, the problem here is very simple. If I tell you that there is a blind person 
that I know of and he or she is suffering some problem in their lives. Now, your first reaction would be that for blind people, the government's priority should be to give them good education. The government's priority should be maybe to give them good job, maybe to give them a house, livelihood, etc. We think that people who are blind or people who actually can't hear properly, for them, their priority would never be to consume content, to watch a movie, etc. But that is not the case. See, in order to live a normal life, each and every component of a normal life has to be given to them. It's not that if you have just given them job, if you have just given them a place to live, you have actually fulfilled every aspiration that they have. They might have some other aspirations. Every single human being wants to refresh, wants to have fun, wants to enjoy, wants to watch movie or something else on social media. But when you don't give these kind of opportunities to people who are disabled, you're actually taking away a major, major part of their life. So our thinking that the priority for these people should just be to earn money and live is not really true. The priorities of someone who is blind or deaf are the same as us. So we have to take care of each and every aspect of their life. Now, I also wanted to give you examples of some of the initiatives launched by the government in the past few years to help people with different forms of disability. For example, the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment's department, which was earlier called Persons with Disability, is now renamed as Divyangjan Sashakti Karan Vibhag. The 2016 Act that we discussed promotes the rights and dignity of people with disability in different sectors, be it education, social, legal, economic or even the political sphere. The Government of India is also giving special attention to government buildings to make them fully accessible to the disabled. For example, there are hardly any buildings where there are separate washrooms for those who are disabled. There are hardly any buildings that have entry ramp for people who are on the wheelchair. All these things have to be taken into consideration. The same is with TV viewing, as we discussed. There should be programs where content is designed to be consumed for people who are blind or who cannot hear properly. The Government of India has also launched the Sugamya Bharat app to address the accessibility issues faced by differently abled people. Then there are other initiatives of the government in the education sector and also to rehabilitate people who have been suffering from these kind of disabilities. All these things have been launched by the Government of India in the past few years. If you look at the statistics with regards to the people who are disabled, these are actually huge, huge chunks of population that are being kept out of normal day-to-day -day life, not just in India, but across the world. One in 10 people in the world are disabled. One in five of the world's poor population are disabled. So the poor people actually have even worse of a situation and they need even more help from the side of the government. And that is why the government's policies should actually be made in such a manner that they are helpful and they take into consideration the requirements of all the people who are disabled. The next article that we have here focuses on the manufacturing sector in India. Recently, the finance minister of India, Nimla Sitaraman, had asked the leaders of the industry, why are they not investing more in the manufacturing sector? What is it that is stopping them from investing in manufacturing? If you look at the numbers, that is the index of industrial production, or if you look at the purchasing managers index, all these numbers show that the demand in India's manufacturing sector is still not up to the mark. Yes, we have recovered well after the pandemic is over. However, if you compare our levels of growth as compared to the pre-pandemic level, especially in the manufacturing sector, there is still a long, long way to go. The government has been trying to give a push to manufacturing in their own capacity. For example, in September 2019, government had cut the tax rate for domestic companies from 30% to 22%. Now, when the government does this, the government expects that if we are taking lesser taxes from these organizations, so the money that they save, they will actually invest it back in building infrastructure, in building more manufacturing plants, so that people might find more jobs. But that is not always the case, as it has happened here also. The government might have reduced the tax rates for the corporates, but this has not really resulted in corporates investing that money in the manufacturing sector. Even if you look at the gross fixed capital formation in the past few years, it has not been up to the mark. The manufacturing growth has been very, very steady. However, if you compare it with the pre-pandemic level, the growth is nowhere to be seen. The government has announced recently 
that they will be spending much more on infrastructure. In fact, if you look at the respective state governments, many of them and many union government ministries also have spent more money on capital expenditure. Capital expenditure means building more physical infrastructure so that people can get more jobs, people can get more salaries, etc. So government expects more money in the hands of the people. But even that has not really held because the companies and the market leaders are not investing more money. Now, the problem here is that in the Indian society, we are not seeing enough demand from the people. People are not buying enough things. That usually happens when people themselves are not really confident of the economy. For example, if I am not really sure how long will I have the job, if I am not really sure how long would I earn a salary, I will obviously not spend a lot of money. I will keep saving. So reduction in demand in the market is a clear indication that people are not hopeful about the future. People are not optimistic about the future. When people are optimistic about their future, they always spend more and the demand increases. So all that has to be taken into consideration if the government has to give a push to the manufacturing sector. Now, Government of India, as you know, a few years back launched the Make in India initiative. The objective was to give a major push to manufacturing sector in India by launching a lot of schemes, by increasing our export in various sectors. Now, it has not really touched its true potential, but yes, there have been certain positive changes that have been seen in various sectors. Let me give you some examples of the initiatives launched by the government of India to actually further this aim. We now have a national single window system because to the investors who want to open up new setups in India, their biggest complaint was that they have to take a lot of permissions from different government departments, ministries, etc. For them, the government has made one single portal to get all the clearances. Then we all know about the Gati Shakti scheme under which the government of India is giving a push to logistical infrastructure in the country. We also have one district, one product initiative under which the government of India has actually plans to make individual districts famous for one specific product. Products such as handloom, handicrafts, textile agriculture, so that each and every district can be well known and famous for that particular product. The government of India is also focusing on toy industry. We have been trying to reduce our import of toys and export many, many more toys as compared to earlier. Under this, the government of India has increased basic custom duty from 20% to 60%. We have also implemented quality control order and sample testing of imported toys. The government is also giving a push to semiconductor industry in India, especially after the lockdown, because of which the semiconductor industry supply chain in the entire world got a major shock. We have actually been given multiple incentives to companies around the world and in India to set up their manufacturing plants in India. As you would have seen, Vedanta is setting up a huge manufacturing plant of semiconductor chips along with Foxconn in Gujarat in the coming months. So that is also on the right path. The next article that we have here is about genetically modified crops. The Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee that works under the Union Environment Ministry has again accepted the proposal that we can start testing out genetically modified mustard crop in India. Now, as you know, genetically modified crops means those crops that have been genetically engineered to either increase their productivity or make them resistant to pests, etc. The fact is, in India, the only genetically modified crop that is allowed is GM cotton. So cotton is the only GM crop that exists in India on a commercial scale. Now about GM mustard, there have been multiple proposals that have been given in the past. The government sometimes says yes and they again say no. Now finally again they have said yes to the proposal of launching it commercially. It was in 2017 also that they had said yes to the proposal, but later on the government had taken back the permission. With this proposal now, GM mustard becomes the second crop to be allowed to be commercially cultivated in India. This will be done for only four years for now. In these four years, the government of India is saying that the experts will visit all these sites where GM mustard is being grown. They will test it out and if there is anything wrong that is found, we will cut short this experiment. Now, there are a few things that you need to understand. GM mustard is indigenous. It is not exported from outside. It is actually a result of Indian scientist hard work. 
Secondly, the reason why we have taken so much time to actually give permission to GM mustard is when you actually cultivate cotton, it is not as dangerous because no one is consuming it. So even if there are some harmful effects, you will not really see it on the human body. But when you actually allow something which has to be consumed by the human body, you have to be much, much more careful. That is why for GM mustard, the government has been very, very careful in allowing it. Although many countries around the world have allowed GM cross, but we have been very, very strict with this. India usually, whenever it comes to allowing new kind of technology in India, is not very risk-taking country. We usually like to play it safe. We usually see how the nations across the world are actually accepting new technology. Only then we say yes to it. And there are multiple examples of it. You can talk about the COVID-19 vaccine for children. We waited for many countries to actually accept that. Only then we went ahead with this. Same with GM crops. Yes, GM cotton is allowed in India. This actually has two alien genes from soil bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis that ensures that the crop is free of any pest. There's also BT brinjal that is not allowed in India. There were some tests that were conducted. The government of India first allowed it, but then it was put on hold because of a lot of protests by activists who have been against this crop. There are many activists who don't support the genetically modified crops. They are saying that this is against nature. This is against the interest of the farmers also because poor farmers might not be able to afford the seeds. It might have long term problems which we are still not able to get rid of. Then we have the GM mustard. This is the one that is now being allowed in India for commercial cultivation. If you look at nations around the world, they have already allowed maize, canola, soybean and many, many other GM crops to be cultivated in very, very large numbers. In India, the responsibility to allow or disallow such crops is with the GEAC. This works under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and it is headed by a special secretary or an additional secretary of the same ministry. It has 24 members which meet every month to review the applications which have been given. Now, whenever an application has to be submitted, that is, request to allow certain kind of GM crop, the application has to be accompanied with all the tests that are conducted by the same company or the organization. The government itself would not go ahead and conduct the safety test. The safety tests, etc. have to be conducted by those companies who are trying to get permission from this particular committee. This is a committee that gives a final approval to go ahead with GM crops in India or not. The next article that we have here is about ISRO, where ISRO has made a statement that they will be trying to expand the usage of NAVIC further. As you know, NAVIC stands for Navigation with Indian Constellation. This is the Indian version of the GPS. GPS, the same software that you use on your Google Maps, is actually a US military software. It's a satellite-based software, as you know, which allows you to track the movement of people to actually know about the direction in a certain place. Many nations around the world have made their own versions of GPS. Like Russians use GLONASS, the European Union has their own version called Galileo. For any nation to be truly independent when it comes to making strategic decisions, these kind of technologies are extremely, extremely important. That is why ISRO has actually made this system for the Indian government called NAVIC or IRNSS. The difference between these and the Indian version is, while GPS, Galileo, etc. give worldwide coverage. For example, you go to France, you go to Australia, Italy, Turkey, wherever you go, the same Google map will actually work just like it does in India. It is based on GPS. It gives you worldwide coverage. But the Indian system, that is IRNSS, is made for India and 1500 km radius around India and not across the entire world. Because the more area that you want to cover, the more satellites you have to spend. Indian IRNSS system right now works on seven satellites, while systems such as GPS, etc. have many, many more satellites as compared to ours. The other point is, even today, although it has been launched, you will hardly see anyone using Navic on your mobile phone. People use Google Maps or GPS only. Why is that? That is because the technology that we have on our mobile phones is still not compatible with Navic. The Indian government actually has been asking mobile phone manufacturers in India to change their configuration and allow people to use Navic as well. But the mobile phone manufacturer is saying that changing that hardware will cost them a lot of money 
and they might be able to do it only by 2025 and not before that. ISRO has said that they are thinking of adding L1 band to Navic. L1 band is the same band on which GPS works. So if L1 band is launched in Navic, our normal mobile phones will also be able to use Navic app. Right now, Navic is only compatible with L5 and S frequency bands, which is not easily caught by the mobile phones that are used by common public. They're easily caught by military equipments. So Navic is still being used by Indian military, but not by common people because our mobile phones are still not compatible for it. ISRO is also thinking of adding more satellites so that the more satellites that we launch, the bigger would be the area coverage given by Navic. Now, as I said, Navic is based on seven satellites, three of them geostationary and four of them geosynchronous. Geostationary, as you know, are the ones which seem stationary from any point of time, wherever you are on the earth. These satellites will actually give a coverage across the Indian mainland and 1500 kilometer radius beyond the Indian borders as well. They are open to all the users. Accuracy will be better than 20 meter. Just like GPS, the Navic will also have two versions. One version for the military, which will be much, much more accurate. And one version for retail users like you and me, which will be not as accurate as the military. These are the other examples of the global positioning system that we have. US has their own with 31 satellites. GLONASS, which is of Russia, it has 24 satellites. Then China also has its own called Beidou. That has 35 satellites now. Galileo with 40 satellites. India has 7 right now. And our plan is to increase it furthermore. The difference being as I said. While our system only gives coverage in Indian mainland and 1500 kilometers. All others actually give global coverage. That is why this is a big big difference between all of them and India's system. These are the important articles to be analyzed from the Hindu newspaper today. Now a couple of practice questions. Number one, India's reluctance in permitting GM crops is based more on politics than science. Critically analyze. Second, colonialism resides more in our thinking than physical symbols. Do you agree? Elaborate. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video. Have a good day ahead.